kursi kayu yang tertanam dengan apa itu meja tangan yang bisa dibuka tutup gitu ya ini versi baru wajah F114 Profesor Gemsto sudah masuk ke Zoom. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> Good morning. Well, thank you. How are you? Good. And yourself? Sorry. It's almost seven. You used it, right? <clears throat> Pardon me, I, I didn't hear what you said. I I said it is seven in the morning, almost seven in the that, morning. That's correct. So welcome and thank you for joining us this. Uh, thank you. We will start <coughs> minutes uh, later. So if you still have some Okay, I'll turn on I'll turn on my camera just to do a camera check. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Camera check looks okay. Are you in the office or at home? I'm in my office. Thank you. So we are here in one of the uh, in the university. Uh, there are seven of us here in the room. The management team and uh, a few colleagues. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'm ready to go when you are. You just give me this, just alert me, and, and we'll take off. Yes, I will. Bapak Ibu, semua yang lain, saya kira nanti di dalam acara webinar ini ada presensi yang harus diisi untuk Bapak Ibu mendapatkan certificate yang sudah dipersiapkan oleh teman-teman panitia di sini. Karena itu nanti link disediakan. Saya minta kesediaan Bapak Ibu, teman-teman semua untuk mengisikannya. Nanti ada waktu kita akan menjelang akhir acara, kita akan mengambil foto bersama. Saya mohon kesediaan juga nanti kita semua bisa turn our camera on, sehingga kita bisa lihat wajah-wajah tersenyum kita semua, Bapak-Ibu. Teman-teman akan mengambil foto di setiap screen yang yang ya so, malam ini kita akan ada berapa layar peserta yang mendaftar sekitar 450 
kurang lebih hampir hmm. baru masuk ke room kita sekitar 154 segera berjalan pada jamnya sebelum itu pukul tujuh sih saya akan memulai beberapa pun saya kira kita sudah lumayan saya cuma tujuh orang atau saya akan tambah saya kira So how is Houston now, Professor Tour? Uh, uh, Houston's very nice now. The weather's very nice. I mean, it's it's hot and humid here, but uh, this time of year, it's really beautiful. So it's it's uh, uh, fall season, right? Yes, it is the fall season. That is correct. We in Indonesia, especially in Java, we are turning to um, rainy season. Thunderstorm. Mm. Okay. So in Indonesia, we yeah we have two hundred and around hundred and. 70 million people. Mm. The university has around 17,000 students coming from uh, all over Indonesia. So we call our university uh, the miniature of Indonesia because of uh, the, the, the composition of students coming from all provinces in Indonesia. It's just a, a small information for you. We're running with about 450 uh, academic members. Uh -huh. we have, uh, 14 uh, faculties. Teacher training, yes, social sciences uh, disciplines and uh, some in natural sciences and also uh, technic technology uh, disciplines. Mm -hmm. we, we have three campuses. Uh, this is the main uh, first and the main campus uh, we operate now. So it's <laughs> 9.59, we, we shall stop. It's okay, Professor Tio? Yes. Okay. Uh, Ibu Bapak dan Saudara-saudara sekalian, saya kira sambil Bapak-Ibu kita melihat teman-teman kita masuk, uh, perkenankan saya apa itu membuka webinar malam hari ini. Uh, dan saya akan pimpin di dalam bahasa Inggris. Uh, kita akan mengalir, saya kira, dalam uh, perjalanan sekitar satu jam lebih dari uh, waktu yang tersedia buat kita. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank you all for being here tonight. It is an honor for me to be your host in this webinar. I wish you all well and safe during this time of COVID-19 pandemic. And again, thank you and welcome to webinar. I would like to especially welcome Professor James Mitchell Tour, our speaker this evening here in Indonesia or morning in Houston where Professor Tour lives. Good morning, Professor Tour. It's Good morning. Really... Good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tour. It's truly an honor to have you here with us today. I believe all participants have been so eager to hear and learn a lot from you during this webinar. Bapak dan Ibu, allow me to briefly read the credential of Professor Jim Tour. Jim is T.T. and W.F. Chow, Professor of Chemistry, also a professor in material science and nanoengineering. 
also in professor in computer science at Rice University in Houston, United States of America. He is a graduate of Syracuse University for his bachelor and Purdue for his PhD in chemistry, particularly synthetic organic chemistry. He did his postdoctoral programs at University of Wisconsin and also at Stanford University. Professor Tour's research areas in R including nanoelectronics, graphene electronics, carbon nanotube and graphene synthetic modification, silicon oxide electronics, carbon nanofactors for medical application, CO2 capture, water purification, among many interests upon which he has built his highly scientific reputation. Professor Tour has published far too many number of publication compared to many of us. That is more than 700 scientific publication in top ranked journals. His work have recorded far too high number of citations, more than 117,000 citations. He has more than 150 patent families they are patent families, not only patents. About 70 company, 17 companies have been set up from those intellectual rights, if not more. I cannot read all of his records, but we certainly know that Professor Tour has been amongst the top ranked and highly influential scientists in the world. So again, it is truly an honor for your generosity accepting my invitation to speak to us this morning or evening here in Indonesia. As a Christian, Professor Thor is also an exemplary Christian. He has devoted his time to study the Bible slowly and deliberately every morning. He has completely reading the Bible every two to three years. Before I start the webinar by inviting Professor Tour to deliver his main points, addressing the webinar's theme on the relationship of science and faith, particularly what has been an exemplary, as what has been an exemplary life lived by Professor James Tour as a scientist and also a man of faith let me first ask Dr. Joseph Mambu, Deputy Director, Institutional Relations and Internationalization at UKSW, to lead us in prayer to open the webinar. Dr. Mambu, your time, please. Good morning, Professor Tour. Uh, allow me to lead the even in a prayer first in our Christian faith. Let us pray in this endeavor. Heavenly Father, we really thank you for the opportunity that we can gather in this place, both in Indonesia and the United States. We are really blessed and we are thankful for this opportunity that we can learn from the life of Professor James Stewart on how he could relate science and faith. And we are really thankful that we will learn from a notable scholar in the world and how we can move on as a Christian university in Indonesia to also learn to get the spirit from Professor Tour and how we move on as academics, as people in Indonesia to move forward in our life. And we also want to dedicate this time, the next few minutes or hours. So we are learning or confessing our faith in a way that we will extend the kingdom of God. And I was actually reminded by Apostle Paul in the, uh, the second Corinthians, the weapons we fight with, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. 
we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we dedicate this time, Lord. So we take our thought captive. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to, Lord, to you, Lord. And we learn, we will learn from Professor Tour how we live a humble life and how as a scholar and scientist, we can also flourish in your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, and bless us all. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you, uh, Josh. Dr. Mambo is a graduate from Arizona State University, Dr. Sartor. So, yeah, uh, now I would like to let you to deliver your speech in about 30 minutes, Dr. Sartor, before we then move into the question and answer. So, okay. 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 So I'm going to share my slides here. Okay. So we're going to talk about science and faith today. And rather than to be here and lecture you on science and faith, I'm just going to tell you the way I do it. And then maybe you can learn from that. Um, so so uh, this is my family, so that you can get to know me. This is uh, let me get my. Th this is my wife Shireen. We have been married for uh, uh, forty years now. This is our fortieth year of marriage, and um, uh, we have four children. The oldest is Umbreen, and this is her husband Philip, and uh, they live in Israel. And she was a mediator between Palestinians and Israelis for more than ten years. Now she's gone back. Now that the children, her children, are in school, her two grandchildren that. Uh, she's gone back to complete her PhD at Hebrew University in, uh, in sociology. And then my next daughter is uh, Sabrina. She's a, an attorney, a lawyer here in Houston. And then there's Josiah. He is a physician uh, working in Kentucky in the emergency room there. And this is Ben. Ben is, uh, um, did, did investment banking and private equity for several years, and now he's gone back to school, so he's back doing his MBA. So that's my family, and I'm really, really blessed to have a great family. That's the blessing of God. <clears throat> I'll start with sharing a few different areas in which we work. Um, we work in an area called laser-induced graphene, and in laser-induced graphene, there, uh, we can take any surface any surface and turn it into, into a, a graphene by just hitting it with a laser that's found in any machine shop, a normal CO2 laser. And that's not dropping graphene on top of, say, a piece of bread. That is converting the carbohydrate strands into graphene. And the laser does that. And this is going to be the basis of about five different companies. Right now, the company that started is something called LIGC uh, Applications. And that will probably spin off another four or five companies from it. Its first product is already on the market. Uh, we split carbon nanotubes. This is another project. These are sold by Sigma Aldrich now. Um, so we, we split those and we can uh, um, uh, turn them into graphene nanoribbons. And in a moment, I will... Let me just get rid of this thing. Um, I have okay. um, we, we can... Uh, we, we, we can take these and use them in certain applications, which I'll tell you about in a minute. This is a computer memory that we've made, computer memory. And uh, this is in a company called Webit. This is a public company now. Uh, this is where we're working on traumatic brain injury and stroke and dementia. And uh, we've developed a, a materials for this. We have a battery company that works off of uh, carbon nanotubes grown, grown seamlessly from graphene. Uh, and that's a company called Zeta Energy. This is in a company now called Dots. This is making graphene quantum dots from, from coal. And this, this company has many, many products out right now. And it's a public company. <clears throat> we work in the area of, oh, sorry about that. 
We work in the area of, of uh, converting plastics into, into uh, um, so th this, this, will convert, this will convert this to uh, uh, a material that can capture CO2. We make graphene from any carbon material. This is a new company called Universal Matter. We were able to make graphene from any carbon feedstock. And this is a new company, it's a couple of years old, and it's just really amazing. We can take just mo most trash you throw out in your house is graphene. We can convert it now into, it, it, it's carbon. And we take that carbon, we turn it into graphene. Uh, we've worked in an area called uh, nano machines, and we can make these nano cars shine a light on them. Oh. These motors spin. Okay, let me go here. Okay, I muted them as well. So I'll just keep this over here and then I can, uh, well, anyway. And, and um, so we can, we can go ahead and, and run these nanomachines like this. Uh, we have, we have uh, uh, these molecular motors that can drill into cells and, and kill them. And this is a, a basis of a new company called Nanorobotics. Uh, these are the companies that I've started in the past six years. And uh, uh, so you can see all the different areas we're into. Here's the companies that I've started. Here's some of the new companies that are starting, probably going to start in Q1 to Q3 next year. We'll start these new companies. So a number of different companies. All right. And this is the last example I'm going to show you of my work. Uh, uh, this is a rat that has had its spinal cord completely cut in two at C5 at the base of the neck. Then we put one drop of a 1% solution of graphene nanoribbons into that gap. And then after two weeks, you will see this rat gets up and starts walking. That's with a completely cut in two spinal cord. And so uh, uh, this is in a company that's going to be developing now uh, uh, these sort of mending for spinal cord and, and um, uh, peripheral nerves. This is not ready for humans yet. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. But you can see that, that uh, uh, after three weeks, the rat scored a 19 out of 21 on a mobility scale. 21 is optimal mobility. And you can see that uh, the rat can do quite well. And uh, um, that's three weeks after complete severing of the spinal cord. Okay. Now, let's, get, let's start talking about what the scriptures say. Is there a prescription for thriving in the Lord? Is there some way we can really thrive in our, in our walk with the Lord? And the Bible tells us in Psalm 1, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. So there is a promise here, and I want you to really listen to this. This is the promise. The man is going to be blessed who does this, who makes his delight in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. The scriptures put it in two ways. Puts it in the way of, of uh, meditating day and night or every day. If you are every day meditating on the word of God, you, this is what will happen. You will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither, and in whatever you do, you prosper. If you meditate on the word of God, there's going to be prosperity in your life. Now, prosperity does not mean wealth. Prosperity means something much richer in a depth of relationship with God. <clears throat> and there is a depth that comes by daily meditation in the word of God. This is daily meditation, daily meditation in the Word of God. And so, so uh, uh, this, this, is, this is what can come if we daily meditate on the Word of God. Is there a prescription for thriving? There's another verse. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that's written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Again, here's a promise that if you meditate on the Word of God day and night. So what is meditation? It's picking up the Word of God 
and saying, Lord, speak to me as I read this book. Hear me now, students. I'm telling you, I'm giving you treasures for success in your career, for success in your life. Think about how much money and time and effort you spend in your career. What I'm giving you now is a secret treasure for excelling. If you pick up the word of God and you will meditate on it daily. Now, daily means every day. There's no blessing written in the Bible for three days a week in the Bible. Maybe there's a blessing, maybe there isn't. But the blessing here is specifically for everyday meditation on the word of God. You pick it up and you say, Lord, speak to me. And then you start reading slowly, pensively, thoughtfully. And then your eyes are going to stop on a certain verse. And, and just repeat that verse. Just repeat and say, Lord, speak to me through this verse. Speak to me. If your eyes get drawn back to a verse, the Lord's speaking to you through that verse. The Lord speaks to me morning by morning. He makes my ear to listen as a disciple. He will do that for you. This is a secret. You can go out and try to compete with the world, but there's a lot of very, very talented people out there that you're up against. Or you can say, Lord, my life is in your hands, and I commit my life to you. I'm telling you what I have seen in my own life, the blessing that comes by daily meditation. And the promise is here, that you'll be prosperous and you'll have success because you'll be careful to do according to all that's written in it. When you meditate on the word of God, you'll be careful to do according to all that's written in it. Psalm 119 says, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. I have more insight than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. If you will take this and meditate on it all the day, every day, you will be wiser than your enemies. You'll have more insight than all your teachers if you make this testimony your meditation. That's the promise. Not up to me to keep that promise. I didn't make it. God did. He'll keep the promise. He will keep the promise. There's an excitement of a scientist with faith. Real excitement of a scientist with faith. Here's an example. September 3rd, 1993, I was invited to Purdue University to give a talk. I had gotten my PhD from Purdue University in, in uh, 1986, 1986. So I had already been out. I did a two-year postdoc. And then in 1988, I started as a professor. I was already tenured by this point. I already had tenure, but I was invited and I was staying here in the Purdue Memorial Union and Hotel. It's a beautiful hotel. And it's run by the students who are, who are uh, uh, studying restaurant and hotel management. And I, I was praying that morning, as I do before every lecture. And I said, Lord, I, I was praying and, I, and, and, and then I was started meditating on the scriptures. And as I was reading the scriptures that morning, here's what it, the verse that came to me as I was reading. Truly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. And I said, Lord, you're really raising my faith, my faith through this. Lord, I pray that the seminar that I give today, this chemistry lecture today in the department, would be the best seminar ever in that department. And now I was a little more nervous than usual because here this was going to be viewed by all the professors who had trained me. And, uh, um, and, and one professor in particular who had been my mentor, the one who, who, who under, in whose group I got my PhD, his name was H. Nagishi. Now, many years later, in 2010, he received the Nobel Prize in chemistry for the palladium catalyzed cross-coupling reaction. But, but uh, at that time, he was just a regular person. But every time when I was a graduate student and I brought him a result, I brought him what I thought was a good result, he would say, pretty good for your level. And he'd move his hand back and forth, but his hand was always at his waist, just as his belt buckle. And so I never got above his belt buckle, never got above his waist. He'd say, pretty good for your level. And as I was praying, I said, Lord, I pray that my, my professor, Professor Nagishi, would not just say that, that it's pretty good for your level, but that he would say it was super, that it was a super seminar. I pray in that way that I'll know then 
that it was the best seminar ever in that department because I said, Lord, if it's, I'm praying it's going to be the best seminar. Well, how do I know it's the best? Well, if you, if you confirm it, Lord, if you confirm it by, by, um, by say, if, having this man say it was a super seminar, then I will know. When I got done with that seminar, that Japanese man, my professor, who was sitting on the front row, he stood up, he raised his hand, and he said, super, super. And uh, I knew that, that God had really blessed in that way, that he, he caused it to be the best seminar ever in that department. And then sitting right behind Professor Nagishi was another professor, H.C. Brown, who had received the 1979 Nobel Prize. I had known him when I was a graduate student. And he was sitting there. He was in his 80s at the time. And I walked down off the, the, the podium and I, <clears throat> I shook his hand. I said, thank you so much for coming to the seminar today. And he held on to my hand. He says, I just want you to know something. That was the best seminar I've ever seen in my life. And I said, sir, it's very kind of you to say that. And in typical Nobel Prize winning fashion, he said, I'm not saying it to be kind. I really mean it. And uh, God confirmed that that was the best seminar ever. There is an excitement of being a scientist with faith. Application of the scriptures in my career. Here's another application. One day I was upset with a colleague because my career was just really taking off. And there was another young colleague and he, he had started the year after me. And he came to my office one day and he said, I'll get tenure before you ever do. Well, tenure, you might not understand it, but um, we were not competing for the same position. We had each had our own tenure track. That's a very rude thing to say. I had been there a year longer than him. And, and uh, uh, that's like walking up to somebody and saying to them, I'm better looking than you are. Now, even if it were true, that's a very ugly thing to say. And, uh, um, but anyway, he started saying negative things about me to students because my career was taking off. God was blessing it. And his career was just pretty normal career. <clears throat> and so one day a student told me, oh, he's been saying these things about you. So I went across the hallway. I was going to talk to him. And I was just, I was really upset. And as I stood outside his office, I knocked on the door to talk to this man. And he wasn't in. And then God spoke to me through the scriptures that I had been memorizing, because I had been memorizing all of Luke chapter six with my children. He says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. So I started, I, I said, yes, Lord, I will do that. I started to pray for him and I would go to the chapel. This was the chapel on campus and I would go to the chapel and it was always empty like this. And I would get on my knees right here every day, a practice that I had had since I was an undergraduate and a practice that I maintain to this day where I'll find some lonely place on campus. Often it's the chapel. Just go get on my knees and pray around noontime. And I was, would go pray for him here. And, and God started blessing his career. He got so blessed. His career was so blessed. He got a big NIH grant, an NSF grant, that he got an offer from another university a couple of years later. And he left, and I was delighted he left. I was just delighted. But God showed me that he got a hold of my heart. Once he got a hold of my heart that I could pray for this man, then after a few years, he could just relieve me of this problem. But the key was he got hold of my heart, and I knew what God was saying to me because I had been meditating on Luke chapter 6. Uh, I'm always admonished in the Lord to walk in honesty and proper speech, <clears throat> Proverbs says, Proverbs 3, verse 3 and 4 says, do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. So I have to walk in honesty. The words that I use are very important. And uh, so many times I'm apologizing to people. I apologize to my students if I've used a harsh word, if I've used a wrong word. Actions, particularly toward women. I have to be careful what I say to women. That, that the words can't be misconstrued. <clears throat> I'll give you an example. <clears throat> Early on in my career, I was on the phone with a patent examiner. She was in New York City. So this was in the days before the internet. So you couldn't look up what people look like. And I was on the phone with her. We were working on a patent, not the patent exam. She was the patent attorney outside counsel hired by the university. 
And she said, okay, I'll take care of this. I'm good at that. I said, I'm sure you're good at everything you do. And then there was this pause on the line. She took that in a very different way than I meant it. But I realized that I have to be very careful what I say, particularly in my comments with women that might be misconstrued. I have to be very careful. The things that I do, for example, I never want to have software on my devices, on my phone, on my computer that I don't own or on my, and my group's computers. I want to walk in honesty. And when I do that, God blesses over and over again. <clears throat> I tell my students, don't put any software on the computers that we don't own. If you need a piece of software, I'll buy it. I want to make sure that we don't do anything in violation of what God would have us, the standards that God would have for us. Uh, and you condemn yourself for you who judge practice the same things. We have to be very careful about judging others when we ourselves aren't walking uprightly. But all of this comes through meditation on the word of God. Then you fear God and you see what to do so that you can walk in it. In the Bible, there's this admonition to value my family. So it says, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. I'm very <clears throat> blessed to have a wife for 40 years whom I really love. I enjoy being with her and I love her very much. It says, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he's old, he'll not depart from it. And I'm so thankful for the children that I have. And uh, we always had daily fa family times in the Bible. We'd wake up. I'd wake up the kids at 530 in the morning. And uh, I'd wake up, I'd bring my wife a cup of tea at five in the morning, put it by her bed and have her Bible there so she could wake up and have her time alone. And then, because I, I was up often much, I was always up way before that, but I'd bring her her tea at 5.30 and then if, at five. And then at 5.30, I'd go wake up the kids and then I'd bring them all down to the family room and we'd have daily family devotions from 5.30 to six. And the whole family was there. <clears throat> we would read from Hurlbut's story of the Bible which tracks with the Bible all the way through. <clears throat> so that, that tracks all the way through with the Bible. And, and uh, uh, then we'd work on scripture memorization together and we'd all get on our knees and pray for each other. And then I'd lay my hands on each one of my family and pray for them. And then I was out of the house by six. So I've maintained that pattern where I was always uh, about my work by 6 a.m. And so I left the house at 6 a.m. But then I was always trying to be at home by 6 p.m ready for dinner to have dinner with the family. And then I'd put the kids to bed while my wife cleaned up the kitchen and, and, uh, um, and starting with the youngest, I'd put them to bed and then the next and the next all the way up to the oldest. And then as the kids got older, uh, they'd put me to bed uh, because they, they'd stay up later than me. But I always tried to, 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 though I worked 12 hours a day, I was gone 12 hours a day. I tried to be, have that time in the morning with my family and then the time in the evening where we'd have dinner together. And then once I was home, I was home. A disciplined schedule of work time and family time. Uh, colleagues have asked me, how do you do it? So this is Rick Smalley. He won the 1996 Nobel Prize. Uh, he was a professor here at Rice. And he used to ask me, Jim, how do you do it? How do you have this wife that loves you and, and uh, these kids that love you? Because he had been through multiple marriages and and uh, multiple broken homes. And, and uh, this is what they see in our lives. This is the pattern they see in our lives. And uh, a couple of years before his death, he gave his life to the Lord. And it was just a dramatic change. And he died uh, uh, actually in 2005 of leukemia. Uh, hard work coupled with a balanced family life. I wrote this in this article in Journal of Organic Chemistry. I was asked to write about, about my career. <clears throat> and uh, this is something that I wrote <clears throat> directly in that, in that uh, journal, in that journal article. <clears throat> I submitted 37 proposals in my first 36 months as a faculty member. <clears throat> and most of those as a single principal investigator since collaborative proposals were less common in those days. So I worked very hard, 37 proposals in my first 36 months. And there was no online submission in those days. <clears throat> you had to run off, you know, 14 copies of proposals, check every page to make sure every page was there and mail it in. <clears throat> and then I wrote this. On the days of receiving the declination of funding letters from the NIH, <clears throat> sadness certainly followed. I would always call my wife, Shireen, because she was repeatedly there 
to reassure me of my self-worth, and my children were still there to call me daddy. Hence, I endeavored to dwell only momentarily on the harsh, sometimes even unnecessarily personal, comments of the reviewers. I urge you, as you build your careers, that you do not trash your family along the way. Do not trash your family. They will be the strongest support to you. My wife would just tell me, I know you're going to be successful. I know you can do this. And my kids didn't know what was going on. They didn't know the discouragement that I was getting at work. But they were there and they just called me daddy and <clears throat> brought me right back down to the, the, the precious things in life. Creativity. What is, what is it that sets us apart in our field? In my field as a professor, it's creativity. It's not how smart you are. It's not what your IQ is. I'm not the smartest person out there. I don't have the highest IQ. What it is, it's creativity. Where does creativity come from? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> there's a man in the Bible who Moses commissioned to build the tabernacle. <clears throat> he was a craftsman. He wasn't a professor. He wasn't, he wasn't a preacher. He was a craftsman. And here's what it says of him in Exodus 31, verse 2 and 3. See, I have called by name. This is God speaking. See, I've called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom in understanding, in knowledge, and in all craftsmanship. God says, I've called a man, his name is Bezalel. I know his father, I know his grandfather, Uri and Hur. I know what tribe he's from. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God. Did you know this is the first reference to the infilling of the Holy Spirit in the Bible? The first reference is of a craftsman. I've filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all craftsmanship. He gave him what he needed for his field. I'm a chemist. I said, Lord, give me creativity. If you read about <clears throat> Bezalel later in this chapter, you will see chapter 31 and also in chapter 36, he could work in gold, in silver, and in bronze. He could work in stone cutting and in stone setting. He could work in wood, in fabric, and in perfuming, and he had the ability to teach it. This guy was amazing. I say, Lord, give me the creativity of Bezalel. I pray thee, O Lord, give me the creativity of Bezalel. Lord, give my students the creativity of Bezalel. And it is amazing what God drops in our laps, the way he leads us. <clears throat> The Bible says in James chapter four, you do not receive because you do not ask. So the main reason <clears throat> you don't receive, we don't receive answers to prayer is because we just don't ask. So I ask. <clears throat> the scriptures, <clears throat> the scriptures are our life. Deuteronomy 32 verse 45. Moses is now going to summarize 40 years of instruction. Here's how he summarizes it. When Moses, Moses had finished speaking <clears throat> all these words to all Israel, he said to them, take to your heart all the words with which I am warning you today, which you shall command your sons to observe carefully, even all the words of this law. For it is not an idle word for you. Indeed, it is your life. You take to your heart the words that I'm teaching you today. Students, take this to your heart. Professors, take this to your heart. It's not an idle word for you. It is your life. What I've just shared with you today, this is your life. You can make a decision to this day, start walking in this, or you can just blow this off like another teaching. What I've shared with you are words of life. Moses said, this is your life. The scriptures are our life. I urge you to meditate on the scriptures every day. I started reading the Bible shortly after I got saved in 1977. Uh, and I started reading the Bible every day, and I would just pick up where I left off the day before. I start in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. I read all the way through the Gen to Revelation 22. When I'm done, I start again. And I just go through the Bible over and over again for well over 40 years. This is life. This is life. Indeed, it is your life. <clears throat> how do you get peace in your life? I've never known anybody who didn't want to have peace. I've never known anyone who says, oh, I just wake up in the morning and I say, Lord, I, I hope this is going to be a terrible day. I hope everything goes wrong. No, everybody wants peace. 
for themselves and for their family. The Bible tells us in Philippians 4.9, the things that you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, that's Paul speaking, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. What you have heard today, you practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Peace comes through practice. You practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. This is just, <clears throat> I'm going to sh just share a couple of verses for those who are not saved. Because I don't assume that I could be speaking to almost 400 people and that everybody is saved. Here's what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. God says, I, even I. I'm the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. God is the one who comes and appeals to you. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden. Come to me, come to me. He says, I will give you rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Jesus implores you to come. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So here's the offer that I give to you. For all of you who are watching this, whether in real time or you're going to be watching the recording, here's what I offer to you. <clears throat> that if you, <clears throat> if you do not believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, this is not an invitation to believers. This is an invitation to unbelievers. If you do not believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, Allow me to share with you one-on-one -on -one via Zoom for one hour, and you will come out believing in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. Please give me that opportunity. If you are not a believer in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, you send me an email. And you send me an email right here to tour at drjamestour.org. Send me an email to tour at drjamestour.org. And I will reply to you setting up a Zoom time. And I know you're in another country and we'll set up a convenient time for the two of us. And I will share with you and you will get saved that very day. You contact me if you don't believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ and you just want an hour with me, it's not going to happen. I just don't have that kind of time. But this is an invitation to the unbeliever. And if you want to see more of my videos, you can go to Facebook. Uh, uh, if, if, uh, I'm sorry, you can go to, to, uh, to YouTube and you see a bunch of my videos. My YouTube channel is just DR James Tour. Just DR James Tour is my YouTube channel and you'll be able to find things. And with that, I'm going to just pray for you and then, uh, um, and then turn it back over to the rector. Let's pray. <clears throat> Oh, but Father, I thank and I praise you for your mercies and your grace and the opportunity to, to join with these young people today. And I pray, Lord, what has been revealed to them, the blessing that comes by scripture meditation, how you then intercede on our lives to bless. I pray, Lord, that some of these young people would take hold of it, that from this day, this very day, they would not lay down their head to go to sleep without meditating on the word of God. And then they would pick up a new practice of every day, every day, meditating upon your word. And that they would then see the blessings of God flow. Lord, your grace abound, I pray. Have mercy on these young people. Have mercy on their souls. And Father, for the unbelievers on this call, Lord, I pray that they would take me up on this offer and that they would be saved. Oh, Father, save their souls, I pray, and I commit them to you for the glory of Jesus and in his name. Amen. Thank you. Okay, with that, with that I, will, I will end, I'll stop sharing, and I will open it back up to the rector to take charge. Thank you, thank you Jim, for your beautiful thoughts. Yes, we can discuss some points further. Yeah, we, we at least now have 
quite an understanding of your personal, although it's very uh, really, really, yes. honestly, uh, your videos as well. You, 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 uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble hearing you. Could you speak up a little bit? Yeah. Uh, thank you for your beautiful stories. Uh, we've now had an understanding about your personal and, and family life, also your professional life and achievements uh, that you show us that they are intermingled so well. Uh, your credentials so how the level of commitment you have uh, put and, and the level of achievement you have you have so far uh, achieved as, as a scientist. And also you, you dedicated your life uh, as a faithful Christ follower. So you are so disciplined in, in practicing your faith and we learn a lot from you. Uh, from your work, I like to, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful to see that you, you, you write on the right side of the presentation slide yeah, that from your work uh, for the for the rat uh, experiment make the lame walk uh, make the blind see uh, make the deaf hear it's it's great that that someone like you uh, uh, could turn something that probably uh, yeah hopeless for for number of or, or some situations but you turn uh, things impossible to be yeah to, uh, we can celebrate life uh, better uh, I was just when when I hear uh, you you explain to us uh, that you have achieved all those uh, things you, you achieve in, in your career, I thought, isn't that isn't that just because you are a bright or a smart guy, uh, not not because of uh, your dedicated life as a Christian, uh, as Christ follower, but you you I think you have later uh, explained more to us that we can understand that that's part of you the blessings you have received from God because you follow the words of God. Now I would like to pose some questions, Jim, uh, and would like to invite your responses. Uh, we will enter the first session of question and answer. Uh, Bapa Ibu, while I ask Jim with a number of questions, please start to prepare and post your questions in the chat facility. So I will pick and read them later to Jim to get his responses after uh, to uh, respond to, to questions that I uh, put uh, asked to him in the first session. First, uh, some people accuse you unfairly, in my view, when you speak scientifically about the mystery of the origin of life on Earth, where there was no single biological existence and therefore no biological mechanisms could ever take place at that period. It was a pre-biotic era. Uh, based on your experience and expertise in science, synthetic organic chemistry, you have tried to explain firmly the difficulty, at least until now, yeah, on how can we explain the abiogenesis Based, based on current understanding. Could you comment more on that issue, particularly on any possibility to have scientific evidence that could lead us closer to have a better explanation on that time period? Uh, and yeah, that from the chemical processor that could lead to the existence of life. On the other hand, what would your suggestion uh, that we as Christians should position ourselves in such a situations in the light of scientific understanding, but also strongly based on faith, if there would be no conflict 
whatsoever in the sort in that sort of problem. So it's it's about the the abiogenesis. Uh, would you comment on how could we come closer to explain that that time period, Jim? So <clears throat> as scientists, we are clueless on life's origin. We have no idea how it started. Those who would say differently are wrong. They are wrong. Uh, uh, synthetic chemists, those who make molecules, know how hard this is. Now, that's not to say that we will never know. I never have spoken from a God of the gaps position. God of the gaps saying, well, if we don't know, God must have done it. No way. There's lots of things that we don't know. And then we find out uh, how these things are, are, are there how these things happened, that, that they were no longer mystery, but on the origin of life were clueless. Uh, we can't even take the existing components of a cell, dismember, just take, we, we, you have four classes of compounds. You have, you have to have amino acids, uh, nucleotides, uh, lipids, and, and uh, so you, you have to have each one of these. So you have to have the lipids, the, the amino acids, which are going to make your proteins, the nucleotides, which are going to make your DNA and your RNA, and then you have to have the carbohydrates. And, and uh, every one of these classes of compounds, we have no good synthetic route to them uh, uh, that, that come in chiral form with high, high homochirality, with a homochiral, or even high enantiomeric excess. Some will argue, well, sometimes these things have come from space. Yes, they absolutely have, but they're generally mixtures of many. And, uh, uh, and so when they come as mixtures, you can't use them. Uh, and then even if they came, how do you polymerize them? And then even if you had them in polymeric form, how do you assemble them into a cell? All of these, we do not know how to do. So you can claim whatever you like, but we just don't know how to do it. So those who would claim otherwise are just wrong and time will prove them to be wrong. Now, that's not to say that we will never know. I can just tell you we are far from knowing that today because there's so many gaps. Even if you were to give everybody all those four classes of compounds in whatever order, having the information stored in them, in whatever order they would like, they can't assemble a cell. No way. You can't even take a cell and dehydrate it where you take out the waters of hydration. You take out all the water and then try to put it back together again. The thing is lost because you've lost the interactomes. I have a 13-part teaching on my, on my uh, YouTube channel that talks about the difficulties of this. So as believers, we just have to say we just don't know. It doesn't mean that we will never know. I do believe what the Bible says, that, that God created the, the, the earth and everything in it. In six days, he created the heavens and the earth and everything in it. So God was able to do this, but we don't have the molecular details of how that happened. Uh, so science may be able to, to figure this out someday. Right now, it ha we haven't been able to figure it out, but that doesn't mean that we won't. If you ask somebody 200 years ago, why is it that when the parents are tall, the child is tall, they would just say, well, I guess God does that. Well, now we know that it's, it's prescribed in the DNA and the DNA translates to RNA, and RNA translates to proteins, and proteins are the ones that the, the, the little nanomachines that build the body. So now we know that doesn't make God any less. It makes God actually all the more magnanimous that, oh, Lord, this is how you did it. This is how it happens. <clears throat> so giving a scientific understanding shouldn't take away from our faith. It's just an amazing, amazing process by which information is transferred uh, from a parent to a child through the DNA. So there's many things we learn that shed light, but as far as the origin of life right now, we're clueless. I'm done. Okay. Um, you, you, in one of your videos, um, you say that uh, we so far have not come closer, but uh, getting uh, farther away from, from uh, the ability to explain that period, is it right? Correct. Correct. Because as, as we learn every year more complexity of the cell, yeah. we understand that the target that we're going toward is more complex, not less complex. I see. Um, my second question, uh, you, on the other hand, do not accept the way 
intelligent design proponents try to prove the existence of God, if I'm not mistaken, you say that you don't have any methodologies to prove scientifically and directly the way intelligent design proponents do. Please correct me if I'm not well representing your view here. Another different stand, there is a group of Christian scientists such as Art Louis. I think you, you had an interview with him, if I'm not mistaken, from Oxford who proposed a tasty evolution view as a way to reconcile creationism and the natural evolution. Let's say that evolution is viewed here as a natural mechanism that God created to increase the complexity from the first life or lives. I don't know exactly how, what the first life was, but let's say it started with simple cellular organism. There were phenomena such as Cambrian explosion uh, on one hand and also mass extinction on the other hand. Do you have your own view here, uh, Jim? No, I don't have my own theory, but um, uh, you know, I respect Ard Louis and I respect many other scientists whom I know, like, like Joshua Swamidas, and who hold to an evolutionary model. Um, as a chemist, I just don't see the steps on how they take place. So when I get into the details of the chemistry, I don't see it. Uh, that doesn't mean that, that I'm right and they're wrong. I just don't see it. So I don't see the chemical details of how that would happen. I don't hold to uh, in the, the ID model because I don't have the tools to test it. Now, people are saying, well, here's some tools. Here's some ways we can test it. That's fine. But those tools are not acceptable tools within the realm of the chemical sciences. So if, if we want to bring those tools into the realm of chemical sciences, okay, we can do that. But I, I think to, to uh, 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 I, I just don't have, have uh, you know, so, some sort of uh, chemical toolbox. I have a lot of analytical instruments, but I hold my colleagues to the same standards that I have to hold myself. And uh, I can't just dismiss this and say it's due to intelligent design. I just say, as a scientist, I just don't know. I don't know how these things uh, came about. I don't know how you go from a single cell organism to now a multi-cell organism that has higher level function. I don't know how you change one complex system into another. Now we see, we see small changes all the time. Look, I, I, we do bacterial work in my own lab. You can, see, you can see changes within bacteria. You can see their swapping of the DNA and you can see these changes happen. You see a mutation occur. And that mutation can translate across lots of different uh, uh, bacteria. You can see these things happen, but these are small changes. The bacterium remains the same and that it remains a bacterium. It doesn't become a, that, that, that uh, uh, eukaryotic, prokaryotic cell doesn't become a eukaryote. So, so these things don't change. How do you get evolution of a complex system? So evolution is a slippery term. If you want to say it's these tiny little changes that occur, that's fine. All right, we see that all the time in a lab. But how do you get evolution of a complex system, a system like a, 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 an optical system, an auditory system? And how does this change one system into another? That is a massive change. Body, part plan, body plan changes, big, big problems. Chemically, it's very hard to define. Biologists have no explanation for this. So until we have an explanation, it says, I, I just don't know, but there's no way that I can just say, oh, therefore it's evolution, just say evolutionarily, and therefore I'm going to be happy. No way, I'm not happy. I'm not happy. You can't just say evolution and think I'm going to say, oh, okay, I bow down to evolution. I accept that. No, give me the chemical details and I'll buy into it. But nobody will sit with me and give me the chemical details. So <clears throat> I'm not going to buy into it. Yeah, some some uh, scientists have uh, that they are now rather using uh, uh, proposing their genetic mutations, but but then come to natural uh, evolution, especially uh, from the point of view of uh, Darwinism, they they don't uh, see that as as yeah a good explanation to to the 
process, long process of, of uh, getting uh, the complexity of life becoming as we have uh, today. My third question, Jim, uh, in his book, The Language of God, Francis Collins, the director of National Institute of uh, Health, uh, open for accepting a possibility if there is other intelligent life, not only ours uh, on earth. If other intelligent life truly exists, he considered that that cannot rule out the existence of God because God is beyond space, matter, and time. And God could have created life in other parts of the universe where we could not have any real evidence up to this moment. Although some people believe there is other intelligent being and therefore intelligent life, not only ours. What would your thought on this, Jim, please? Yeah, we have no evidence for there being intelligent life uh, uh, anywhere else in our universe. That doesn't mean that there isn't intelligent life. It may be so intelligent that it obscures itself from us. So we, we, have, we have no idea. So I just don't know. I mean, I'm, you know, I just don't know. My guess is as good as yours. But um, as far as the origin of life, we don't speak of the origin of life. We speak of the origin of first life. So even if you go with a panspermia model that, that, uh, that we were seeded here on this earth by some other intelligent life, that just begs the question, it transfers it now to some other planet, some other space, some, some other universe or whatever you would like. Uh, uh, what is the origin of first life? That's what we're dealing with. As far as intelligent life outside, I have no idea. It doesn't seem like the Bible addresses that at all either. So the Bible doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, give us a clue on that sort of life. It tells us that there is, there is demonic life, there's certain, certainly spiritual life, things beyond what we can see, beyond what we can hear with our natural ears, see with our natural eyes. And the Bible speaks of it, and Jesus was addressing demonic forces all the time. So I believe very much what the Bible says, so that there, there is life out there uh, uh, that, that is... Uh, uh, that the Bible describes, which is, does not take on physical, physical structure, although it can take on physical structure, as we've seen in, in, in the Bible. And sometimes, uh, uh, is, if you think of the serpent in the garden, uh, you can see it occupy physical people. Uh, that's what the Bible talks about. So the Bible does allude to these sorts of things that go beyond our natural uh, physical realm. It does speak of the metaphysical. But as far as our detection of life, intelligent life outside of this planet using our scientific means, we've never found it. But we know, we know that there is life that, that is, that is uh, uh, metaphysical life that the Bible speaks about. So, and I believe the Bible. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, based on yeah, developments in science and technology, this is the third uh, question to you from me. We have and will continue to have uh, into the future, I mean, the development of science and technology. What would you say about the possibility of how such developments would have impacts on faith? You don't see any problem or conflict at all between the two, but their reality has shown that there is a tendency that people could turn agnostic or even atheists, just because they learn more about science. Would you say that that would mean that there would be a problem in the foundation of their understanding of faith? Or how could you comment on that? Yeah, people get drawn astray from the Lord <clears throat> for various reasons. Not just because they learn something in science and they think, okay, this is explained so I don't need God. God goes far, far beyond this, far beyond science. <clears throat> science has never shaken my faith, never. No. And when I learn something new, I just stand amazed at how God has done this thing, how God has set up these physical constants to have these things done. So, so uh, I think this is, this is just all a distraction. And uh, I say we continue to pursue science as much as we can. The extrapolations of this 
are problematic when people say this therefore disproves God. That's absolutely ridiculous. That's a bunch of nonsense. So, so I don't, I don't buy into that at all. Uh, uh, not, this, this doesn't disprove God at all. And so there's, there's plenty here that we can do, plenty of the, here that we, we, we have access to. And people will use all sorts of things. The Bible says, look, you're going you're gonna to have people come and and Bible talks about false prophets, and they're going to say things. He says, don't be drawn astray by these things. Do not be drawn astray by these things. He's testing you to see whether you really believe. And people are going to be drawn astray, and your faith will be tested. And I pray to God that I, that I never leave him, that I never forsake him, because he will never leave me nor forsake me. And I just want to, I want to go to my grave just, just proclaiming that Jesus Christ is the best in every way. People go to stray, be, uh, stray, you know, a, a guy will just give up on the Lord because he wants to pursue a woman, or a woman will give up on the Lord because she wants to pursue a certain man. <clears throat> People do all sorts of things in their rebellion against God. Uh, so it, it doesn't shake my faith at all. Will people be drawn astray? Yeah, people are drawn astray by all sorts of things. Uh, people, you know, a guy contacted me. He was so confused about UFOs. And because they're uh, UFOs, then therefore his faith was all upset. I said, it doesn't upset, upset my faith a bit, not a single bit. And uh, I was able to, to, to uh, 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 you know, just refunnel him back to the Lord. So, so um, uh, you know, we, we are sinful creatures, and we'll use all sorts of means to somehow justify that we don't have to walk into, in submission to the God of the Bible and the Lord Jesus Christ. The, 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 the problem is in the, our own human heart. That's where the problem is. It's in the human heart. That's the source of the problem. You know, we, we are, we are uh, meaning-making creatures, and, and uh, therefore we, we try to attribute meanings to what we uh, see, what we hear, what we uh, discover, and, and therefore uh, probably this is a way of, of looking at those uh, development uh, and what meanings we uh, uh, associate with, with all the developments, so whether it is yeah, naturalism there and therefore uh, there is no uh, God uh, in such a situation or, or on the other hand, we, we could uh, celebrate that this is, this is God's uh, creation and therefore we, we are grateful and, and thank uh, God uh, for the wonderful creation and also the, our life. That's how uh, Isaac Newton, uh, when he discovered the, the system of our, uh, the works of the system of our uh, uh, universe, at least the, the, the planetary system, and he said such system uh, can only uh, come from the council of, or the dominion of, of God. And that's the way the Christian science uh, attribute meanings to what he he uh, discovered, and it's, it's like your uh, opinion, I think. Uh, I would like to uh, come to the second session of this uh, question and answer again. Thank you for your uh, responses to my questions. Uh, there are already a number of questions uh, in the chat. Uh, First, I will try to read to you one of them. Thank you for the amazing presentation, um, Professor James Durr. I have one question. How to combine science and faith consistent, consistently and in balance? Because if we learn, we more lean to science, we would be an apathetic or atheist. If we lean more to the faith, we would be a fanatic uh, to our belief and being denial of the facts. Your comments on, on, on that, James? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> look, what Jesus said, John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said he had a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say 
he has a demon and, and, uh, 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 and he eats with tax collectors and sinners. <clears throat> Whatever you do, people are going to say things. And uh, so some people say that I am a fanatic <clears throat> and uh, because of my following Jesus Christ and believing in his physical resurrection. Well, I believe in his physical resurrection because there's so much evidence for that. And I love it and I will continue to do it. So, so some people in the Christian realm feel that I'm too scientific in my thoughts, that, that I rely too much on science and not enough on the Bible. Whatever we do, people are going to say we're one extreme or the other extreme, depending on, on what their view is. And Jesus said, look, you know, John came one way. You said he was one thing. I came the, the exact opposite. You said something else totally of me. I am just going to walk before my God. Look, I doubt if you have a problem of being, being uh, uh, too scientific. If you want to follow a pattern, look at my life. I mean, how many scientists are there that have accomplished in their lives what I've accomplished? How many are there? So, so there's not many. And, and uh, um, so there was, a, there was a recent study done that they ranked me in the top 0.004% of citations of all scientists who have published at least five papers in, in their career. Okay, so... In other words, I'm in the top very small fraction of percent of scientists. So, so it's, it's odd that some people can say that I can't be a scientist. I mean, I'm doing it. <clears throat> so so uh, uh, it, it, it's being done. And then, and then uh, uh, some people say that, that um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have, I'm, I'm, I'm not relying enough on the Bible. I rely too much on science. Well, look, I have meditated on the Bible every day of my life for over 40 years. How many people have done that, including the people in the Christian community that judge me? I mean, how many people have done that? <clears throat> so whatever I do, they're going to say, you, you know, I'm wrong in some way. I'm a, too extreme in one direction or on the other. I'm going to walk faithfully before my God. I do not have to appear before any of these people. I will appear before the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I will humbly bow my knee and say, Lord, Lord, my life is in your hands. I throw myself solely upon your mercies, solely upon your mercies. And uh, uh, Jesus, in one of his final prayers to his father, he says, uh, um, I've glorified, this is in John chapter 17, verse four, I've glorified you on earth by accomplishing the work that you have given me to do. I've glorified you on earth by accomplishing the work that you have given me to do. I would love to be able to say, Lord, I've glorified you on earth by accomplishing the work that you have given me to do. I know that I will fall far short, but people judge Jesus. I mean, couldn't Jesus have prayed for a few more people? Couldn't he have visited a few more cities? <clears throat> couldn't he, he have done these sorts of things? Certainly he could have, but Jesus did all that his father called him to do. And that's all we can do. And uh, um, uh, so anyway, that's my answer. Thank you, Jim. Uh, there are two questions uh, about God. Uh, first, uh, how do you make sure that you hear the voice of God? And secondly, if God is all-knowing, then why does he need to test us? If he needs to test us, does it mean he is clueless? Oh, come on now. Look, he tests us for our own sake. He tests us so I can see myself. You know, I think I'm really strong. I got it all together. And he puts this little obstacle in front of me and I fall apart. Oh, God, how can you do this to me? Oh, this. And God says, now look at your heart. Are you really as strong as you thought you were? He doesn't need to know. He's God. He puts things in our way to test us so that I can see my own inadequacy so that I can see my own failure. <clears throat> this, these tests in our lives are so that I can see myself, that I can say, oh, I'm not quite as strong as I thought I was. That's why. Now, how do I hear the voice of God? This is a constant struggle for me because my own mind can speak to me too. You know, I think I'm hearing God. This is why I use the scriptures. Many people say, well, the Holy Spirit gives them a thought. The Holy Spirit speaks to them. And that's fine. The Holy Spirit can do that. 
but <clears throat> you, you have this conflicting voice, which is your own voice, and, and sometimes you can mix the two up. This is why I love the scripture. So I'm standing outside this guy's door, knocking on his door, ready to give it to him because he's speaking about some to students about, about me, as I told you this story in my talk. And then God drops on my heart the very scriptures that I've been memorizing. That you are to bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. I am now obliged, commanded by God, to pray for those who mistreat me. He mistreated me. It is now my obligation by God, commanded by God, to pray for him. And that's what I started to do. That scripture nailed it home for me. This is why when we are in the scriptures, it nails it home. I've been studying Romans chapter nine because I'm teaching out of that. Like every third verse he quotes from the Old Testament. I mean, just quote after quote after quote. Why? Because that builds the argument, that frames the whole thing for us. When you have a life that's guided around the Bible, the scriptures, that is our life, that frames it for us and we see the will of God throughout that book. It is just dripping, dripping with the will of God in that book. And it formulates that for us. And so then we take these scriptures and it impacts our heart. And we say, yes, I remember that Bible verse. Or we're reading and something comes, just comes out from that verse. So to me, what really empowers me <clears throat> is that when I feel a scripture verse has come to light, for a particular situation, and then I can bank on it. That's how I hear the voice of God through the scriptures all the time, all the time. Thank you. This is uh, on the mystery of uh, how life was started. The participant uh, asked you, I believe you will know it. He, he or she asked, do you know there is an explanation about, uh, about it? I guess we, you constantly say that uh, we are clueless uh, in explaining uh, the origin of life. But this person say that the second law of thermodynamics the thermodynamics could help you to understand how life was formed, your command of life. So you're saying the second law of thermodynamics could help me to explain how life formed. Uh, I'd love for you to elaborate on that. I'd love for you to elaborate on that, on the synthesis of all these molecules where they have to be made in chiral form so that they can go through a, a, a uh, uh, with chiral induced spin selectivity and all these pieces. To just say the second of law of thermodynamics can explain this is utterly, utterly ridiculous. So if you're going to enter this realm and tell me that the second law of thermodynamics it can help me to explain the origin of life. You're going to have to stand up and start talking about this thing because I don't think you know what you're talking about. I really don't think you know what you're talking about. Cells are really unique sorts of things. There's not too many things in nature where you see this, where you see something that is highly ordered, highly ordered, where you see the, the, this, this, this high order, but also very high in energy. So a cell is a highly structured system but extremely high in energy. These are really unique constructs. So I don't think you know what you're talking about. All right, I'm ready for the next question. Yeah, you, you, dis, you, you discussed with, with Lee Cronin, I guess uh, one of the top researchers in uh, the origin of life uh, research. And I guess from that discussion, uh, from that, uh, Yeah, conversation. Uh, he uh, also uh, he admit that they are not coming closer to explain the origin of life yet. Am I right? You're right. Okay. So yeah, uh, those researchers in that area cannot explain uh, the way life. 
uh, was started. So yeah, your, your comment, I can understand that. I'm turning to uh, the other question. Good morning, uh, Mr. James Stewart. I want to ask, faith is said to believe without seeing, but science proves everything must be proven and then found out the truth. My question, if you experience in your life facts that cannot be explained but by faith, you know that it is God's work, how do you behave? And also, how do you manage your way of thinking? Then, what do you think about the gift that God has given in modern times like today? What do I think about the what that was given? The gift? The what? Uh, yeah, the it, last it, sentence you, you Okay, the last, the last sentence from the first... What do I think about the what? The gift? What do you think about the gift that God has given in modern times like today? So, so yeah. I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. But yeah, any, yeah. anyway, yeah. I don't know what gift you're talking about. You're going to have to specifically name the gift. You mean the gift of his son, Jesus Christ? I, I don't know what you're talking about. But in any case... You know, faith is not always just based on things that are unseen. There is historical written proof of the resurrection. There are historical eyewitness accounts of the resurrection. <clears throat> then you have people from that generation, extra biblical accounts writing about these things. So it's, <clears throat> faith is not purely, and the Bible gives us a written historical account of these things. So there's, there's a lot of facts behind this. Science gives us facts, but not everything is based on facts. For another, in other words, we don't know where these physical constants came from. <clears throat> if you have these physical constants of the universe just slightly off, nothing works. This is, <clears throat> this is just extraordinary. We don't know how these things came about. Why is the universe the way it is? So we have to take that on faith. It is here. <clears throat> so to think that in science, we take everything uh, uh, we, we have facts for everything upon which we base our science. That's wrong. That is wrong. That is a very novice view of science. Okay. We simply defy the understanding about uh, how the universe uh, started to begin. Uh, we have now perhaps two big groups of, of, of uh, feeling this uh, phenomenon whether it is God, the eternal God who created it, and the other group is that the, 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 the universe or itself is, is eternal. It is because of the, the uh, constants of the, the, the natural, the constants of nature or, or the, the, the law of nature. And as, as believer, uh, in that, I guess that we it is it's more acceptable to accept that that God is the uh, uncaused cause. I guess that's your your point of view as well. So, uh, the next questions. There are two questions from this person. Thank you for this amazing presentation, Professor Tur. I have two questions. First, in the field of nanotechnology, what is the most important discovery that really link your faith with science? The second mm -hmm. question, as a professor of computer science, what do you think about the impact of artificial intelligence in today's in today and future faith of Christians? Yeah. The response. It, so as far as AI goes, um, you know, you know bo both of these are very good questions, actually. As, as far as AI goes, 
I think that, that it can have an enormous impact in the way we, what we can do. We're using it in my own group in the sense of machine learning. We're using it machine learning for, for our machines to learn how to make, for example, graphene and optimize on that. And it turns out to be a, an extremely powerful technique. Uh, the whole field of AI, uh, in order to communicate between things, in order to have self-driving vehicles, in order, I think this is going to be tremendous. I think this, the sooner you can get humans away from driving cars, the better. Uh, they have too many accidents. Uh, they're looking at their cell phones while they're driving. I mean, they have too many problems. I want all cars to be communicating with each other so they're not going to run into each other. I want to be able to to work on my cell phone and work on my computer while the car is driving and have, have some AI system doing it. It will affect many things. There's gonna be jobs that are going to transition because of this. Uh, truck drivers, which your country has a lot of, my country has a lot of truck drivers. I think that a lot of things for, for trucking are gonna to go toward artificial intelligence and AI systems driving these things. So the world is gonna shift. Can it be used for evil? Absolutely. Can it be used for good? Absolutely. When, a, when an AI system through machine learning can, can look at a retina and immediately tell things that, that uh, surgeons themselves, retinal surgeons themselves can't understand. I mean, this is great. Will you be able to use it for evil? Absolutely. And people will find ways to use it for evil, but that's true of every new technology. People use cars to drive other people to the hospital. People use cars to rob banks. Uh, uh, and people are corrupt in many ways. So every new technology will do this. And, and we hope that there will be governments and laws that will be there to protect us and, and uh, uh, from, from the, the, the negative use of this. Uh, so anyway, that, that, that's the answer to that. As far as the, the question on what is it within nanotechnology that that has really strengthened my faith. I can't point to anything in particular about nanotechnology, but I can speak in general that whenever we find something new, I am utterly amazed of these things, that science is, 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 is amazing to me. And then when I compare what we do to what happens in a biological system, I stand amazed at God about what he does in these biological systems. When I look at my children grow up, when I look at my grandchildren, I'm amazed at what God does. And then, then he brings in the whole metaphysical realm and, and uh, the relationships, the love. How do, you, how, does, how do I describe what it is that, that, that causes me to love my wife the way I do? Uh, yes, there is a chemical basis of this, of interactions going on in my brain, but there, there seems to be something that, that transcends even that. And uh, uh, is there a difference between the brain and the mind? That's something that transcends the physicalness of the brain that goes beyond that. And uh, 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 so there's all of these questions that, that, that continue to arise that keep me fascinated. I'm fascinated all the time by discoveries we have. There's really no one discovery that, that really, really sets it apart for me. But that's a good question. Thank you. Thank you, um, another question related to the origin of human life about the story of Adam and Eve. The question, the, the question is, is that a real story? If that is real, then we are products of incense. Since Adam and Eve only had two sons, which is possible, which is, which is possible they will marry the mother, I don't know, person with the Bible uh, deliberately. Uh, 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 yeah, how would yeah, you yeah. interpret that story? Uh, yeah, I, I can answer that. So, so you're forgetting one verse. There's another verse in the Bible that says, Adam and Eve had many other sons and daughters. So, so if you read carefully in the book of Genesis, you'll find that verse. So they didn't just have the two sons. Uh, uh, and there's no indication that they were having sex with their mother, but they may have had, they may have, they may have interbred with their sisters. Now, 
To you, to me, incest is wrong because that has been defined by God as being wrong. But that was much later defined as being wrong. That came actually much later. And so that was then underscored tremendously in the law of Moses that was underscored, this whole idea of incest. Early on in the formation of mankind, there was no other way. Now, were they, were they interbreeding with their, with their sisters, those brothers? Maybe so. But there was nothing against it at that time in that point of human history. There's also another view. And uh, it, it's, it's not classical Christian view. It's not cra- classical Judeo-Christian view. But another view, and you can read about this in Joshua Swamidas's book, uh, uh, genetic, uh, uh, the, the, the genealogical Adam and Eve, is that, is that there were human beings, God created people in, on the sixth day in Genesis chapter one. And then in Genesis chapter two, you go into this very detailed account of a particular human being named that he named Adam, and and uh, uh, which just means man. And then the formation of a woman, the formation of a garden in which they were to live. That is often viewed as a zoomed-in version of what happened in Genesis ch- uh, chapter one, day six. But there's also another view that that could have been a de novo, a new creation of man, upon which there was given certain laws, the Edenic laws, the laws in Eden. And, and, uh, uh, and then what happened is that the children of Adam were then interbreeding with these other humans that were in Genesis chapter, chapter 1, sixth day. That could be. We don't know. What I'm saying is that there is a lot to be learned, even from the text itself, does not seem like it's clear, because the book of Genesis seems to be written in, in, in a, a progressive order, in a chronological order. And then after day seven, all of a sudden you see this creation of Adam again. So even in this simplistic account that you're talking about, it's not nearly as simple as you're making it. And number two, the laws against incest came much later. And number three, we don't even know, just based on Genesis chapter one, day six, and Genesis chapter two, Garden of Eden, if that's speaking about the same people, or if this is a new creation of people that is then interbreeding, which would actually line up a lot with what you see in Romans, in the New Testament, Romans chapter five, verse 12 and 13. So I know I'm getting much deeper than you would like, but these are ideas that are kicked around by many scholars. So, so uh, uh, that's not a difficult problem at all to deal with. But thank you for that question. Thank you, Jim. As a scientist, you have you, you question many things, and you have doubts uh, as well on many things. Uh, the question, and the question is. Why bother Bible doesn't like doubts? Uh, is that not dangerous for humanity? Because if we aren't allowed to doubting, means we wouldn't grow to be better advanced species, and maybe we would go extinct since we aren't allowed to make medicine, so we would die due to a disease. Your response. Yeah. Okay, so so the Bible doesn't doesn't dispel doesn't speak negatively of doubts in general it speaks negatively of doubts about god's word when god says it we are to believe it about his word we take hold to his word we hold it fast because we can read in the bible over and over again his truths and life itself screams out that what god has proclaimed that is good and right works so, for example, uh, the Bible speaks of, of, of a home, a mother, and a father, and children. The Bible speaks of marriage, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the beauty of marriage, the sanctity of marriage. And we now have lots of evidence, lots of evidence, that children that grow up in one-parent homes, children that, from homes that are divorced and they're growing up in one-parent homes, have far higher far more psychological struggles in their life, far more trouble in schools, far more likely to take drugs, far more likely to end up in prison. And so the facts itself bear out 
that what God has said is good, is good. It is good. On the other hand, Jesus implores us to be shrewd in our dealings with other people. He, in fact, reproved his disciples. He says, you guys are too naive in the sense that he says, the children of this world are more shrewd about their kind than, than the children of light. So we're not supposed to take everybody's word for things. We're supposed to doubt. We're supposed to confront. Even with the, the, rec, the, the prayer this morning, just before I spoke, it was taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, where we're not supposed to grab every thought and, and take it as it is. We're to take that to the obedience of Christ. And, and, and we, we are confronting these human speculations. So it's not no doubts as, as, as if you're saying that the Bible is preaching that. The Bible doesn't preach that. You have a very simplistic view. The Bible just speaks about that we shouldn't doubt God's word. But everything else in life, you know, we're, we're to investigate. We are to test. The Bible says test these things and hold fast to that which is good. It actually implores us to test these things. And the Bible, like no other religious documents, invites us to test this. Paul is giving an evidence in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 about the resurrection, and he names the different people. And then he says Jesus was seen resurrected from the dead by over 500 people at one time. And he says most of them are alive to this day. So he says you can go and talk to them. He's asking you to test. And then he names, he says, he appeared first to Cephas and then, and then to the 12. And then he appeared to the 500 and he appeared to James. And, and, and uh, he's naming it. You, you want to test this? Here's the people. Here's the people. The Bible gives us these tests. He tells us who the people were that took Jesus' body down from the cross and put him in the grave. He gives us name upon name. It's test upon test where we can authenticate this thing. So, uh, um, uh, the doubts are, are merely that we shouldn't doubt God's word, but thank you for that question. Thank you, Jim. Um, I don't know uh, how many time do you still have. Can we go up until nine? Or do you have uh, other activities before it? Uh, another person asked you, can science and faith be combined and used together? I would like to perhaps reward, rewarding the, the, the question. How would you uh, position the two, science and faith? Are, are there, uh, they have, yeah, they are like uh, non-overlapping magisterial view of, of uh, J. Go, or is that is the two overlap each other, or how can we uh, better feel? Yeah. No, no, I understand. It's a good question. I mean, what do I do with my faith when I come in and study my science? You know, I don't just sit in my office and pray, Lord, just just make everything work for me. No. We have to go in and do science. We have to do our work. We have to do our research work. We use the tools of humankind to do this. But on top of that, I say, Lord, make us like Bezalel. Make us creative. creative. Let us see things that other people don't see. Because the Bible says that the light and the darkness are the same to God. So he sees in the darkness where other people can't see. So I say, Lord, help me to understand. Sometimes a student will bring in a spectrum of a molecule or a, a, some result. And I'm like, I don't understand this. And if the student is a, is a Christian, I'll say, let's pray. And I've gotten down on my knees in my office with my students and we pray, Lord, give us light. We don't understand this. Give us light. Give us light. Help us to understand. And this is how I bring my faith into my science. I don't pray, Lord, give me a result that no one else would ever get. Because in my field, any result that I get has to be reproducible by other people. If other people can't reduce, reproduce it, I'm in big trouble. But I want to be able to see where I wouldn't normally see myself. So we go in, we do the science just like anybody else. You can go in my lab, see my students who are doing research just like they would in any other lab. But I'm in here praying, Lord, give them special insight, that they see things that other people might see, that they think of things that other people might miss. That's where I integrate my faith in my science. 
that I believe that God is going to do good for me. God is going to do good for the things that happen in my lab because I believe his word, that he's going to give me prosperity in my work as I meditate on his word. So I believe that. I take hold of it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Tour. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm afraid it's about time that we would now end this talk that we have enjoyed so far. Uh, Jim has other scheduled works today, so we will therefore will soon finish the webinar. Before we come to the end, I would like to ask again, Professor Tour, to give a closing statement. Uh, and in so doing, may I ask you to give your advice to us as Christians in general, and particularly to us who are working in academia, especially for young scientists. How should we embrace our scientific and faith life to get uh, better? That would motivate us in improving our efforts in advancing science while also going stronger in faith. You, you have, you have uh, of course, uh, yeah. You know, let me, let me distill all of what you heard, just distill this down into one simple thing, because I believe if you give people a list of 10 things to do, you won't get anything done. You have to distill it down to a small, very small number. Let me reduce it down to one thing. If you take the word of God, the Bible, and make it your daily meditation, your daily meditation. And I mean every day, that every day you wake up in the morning and you spend time with God. And why do I say the morning? Because at night, many distractions come in. If you wake up 20 minutes earlier than you normally wake up, you take that Bible and you say, Lord, speak to me through this word. I would recommend you pick up something like the gospel, uh, 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 you, you, you can take the gospel according to John and start reading it and say, Lord, speak to me through this word and just start reading slowly and pensively and deliberately. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Stop right there and just think about that. Read it again and read it again. And then you go to the next verse, read it again. Read it over and over again. Stop. Think about it. All of a sudden, you'll be reading, and your eyes are going to keep getting drawn back to a verse. And then you know the Lord speak. Lord, speak to me through that. Speak to me. Your servant listens. Speak to me. And he'll give you insight even for that very day. And then the next day, after you spent 20 minutes doing this, you start where you left off the day before and start reading. Don't be in any hurry. I don't say that you finish the gospel according to John in a month. I mean, if, if, you spent, if you spent a week in one paragraph, I'm okay with that. Just when you feel that, that God's moving you on, then move on to the next section. If you do that every day, you would do so well. Your, your career, your work will begin to change. People will say there's something different about you. People who used to get upset with you all the time, they say, you, you've changed. There's something different about you. You're going to start being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Jesus is altogether lovely, altogether holy, altogether wonderful. And you become more like him. If you need, so that, that's the first thing. That's it. If you need something to really think about and guide you through the Bible, if you go to my website, jmtour.com, jmtour.com, and you go to across to personal topics, you will find audio files. Under the audio files, you'll find a, a, a teaching called The Chronological Life of Jesus, where I took Luke. Luke is the only gospel that goes chronologically. And I took Luke as the template, but then I brought in all the different gospels. It was a teaching that took me about four years to do once a week for four years. So each one of them is like a 30 minute message. There's 184 messages. And, uh, um, uh, and you just go through that. Just, you just plug it in your ears. You just listen to it. There's no video on it. You just listen to it. You can listen to that while you're brushing your teeth in the morning, get ready in the morning. You will come away with a much deeper understanding of Jesus and, and his whole place in the Bible and what's going on. The most important thing is your daily time of meditation on the word of God. 
If you do that, you will do well. That's what I leave with you with. God bless you. Thank you, Jim, for your wonderful words. Um, we have learned many from you today. We know that it will take tirelessly, no easy efforts to become someone like you. But we know that it's not only a dream. It may be still a dream for us, many of us, but by working harder, it is achievable. Uh, it is achievable dream for any of us who would do that. And also, we let's pray that God may bless each of us so that we can be made better persons according to his will. Before we close this webinar, uh, ladies and gentlemen, may I ask you all to show up your smiling faces uh, to be captured in photos. Uh, Burini, I could help us. Okay, smile. First screen already? Good in. Finish already. Okay, thank you. Um let me now ask Dr. Iwan Setiawan, the future director of academic, to let us in prayer to close this wonderful talk we have had with Jim. By Iwan, over to you. Thank you, Pa Rector. Thanks, uh, Professor Dor, for the wonderful talk. Before we leave this place, before we end our webinar, let us come to a prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we would like to thank you for the wonderful opportunity we had tonight here in Indonesia or this morning in Texas. You have blessed us so that we can learn from the life of a great person an accomplished scientist, and also somebody who is strong in the faith in you. God, this bless each of us so that everything that we learn this evening will not go to waste, but that we can learn from it, that we can do something in our life so that we can grow into a better person, not only in faith, but also in our work as academia. God, in a few moments, we will leave this session. We will go back to our homes and Professor Tu will start his day on the other side of this earth. We pray that you bless each of us, you bless Professor Tour, so that everything that we do, everything that he does, will continue to glorify your name, will continue to make more and more people realize how great you are, and will let more and more people become a better scientist yet a better and more faithful person will grow closer to you. Thank you, God. We surrender everything. We surrender ourselves to your hand. In the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you.
for all your enthusiasm during this webinar. Thank you for being patient as well. Thank you for your participation. I hope that you all have something to take home and reflect to become a better person day by day. Thank you, Professor Tour. It's, a, it's really a blessing for us all here. We cannot pay you for the gift that you have given to us this evening, this morning. We pray that God will pay it back you abundantly according to his will. We hope one day there is a chance for you to come to visit us at Satyawachana. I formally invite you to be our guest here in Salatiga. Thank you very much for all crew of BTSE, BPHA, BMK, to all university management team. This is for us all celebrating the 90, the 65th anniversary of Satyawachana. May in your favor, O Lord, our God, establish the works of our hand. Psalm 90, verse 17, the theme of this anniversary this year. Good night and see you again in the next Creative Minority Forum. God bless you all. Thank you, Jim.